ഓക്കെ ഹിന്ദു മഹാസമ്മേളനത്തിൻ്റെ ഭാഗമായി നടത്തുന്ന യൂത്ത് കോൺക്ലേവിൻ്റെ രണ്ടാമത്തെ സെഷനിലേക്ക് ഇന്നത്തെ രണ്ടാമത്തെ സെഷനിലേക്ക് നമ്മൾ കടക്കുകയാണ് സോ ഇന്നത്തെ ഈ ഈ സെഷൻ്റെ ടോപ്പിക് എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് ഓപ്പറേറ്റീവ്സ് ഓഫ് ഇൻറ്റേർണൽ ത്രെഡ്സ് ഇൻ ഇന്ത്യ ആഭ്യന്തരമായി നമുക്കുണ്ടാകുന്ന ഭീഷണികൾ ഒരു പക്ഷേ വളരെ റെലവൻ്റ് ആയിട്ടുള്ള വിഷയമാണ് സോ ഫോർ ദ കൺവീനിയൻസ് വിൽ ബി സ്വിച്ചിങ് ടു ഇംഗ്ലീഷ് സോ ഹാർട്ട്ലി വെൽക്കം ടു വൺ ഈച്ച് വൺ ഓഫ് യു ടു സെക്കൻഡ് സെഷൻ ഓഫ് യൂത്ത് കോൺക്ലേവ് കണ്ടക്റ്റഡ് ആസ് എ പാർട്ട് ഓഫ് ഹിന്ദു മഹാസമ്മേളൻ ഹിയർ ഇൻ ട്രിവാൻഡ്രം സോ ടുഡേ ദ ടോപ്പിക് ഫോർ ദ സെഷൻ ഈസ് ഐ ബിലീവ് ദിസ് ഇസ് വൺ ഓഫ് ദി മോസ്റ്റ് ഇമ്പോർട്ടൻ്റ് ടോപ്പിക് to be discussed to be talked and to be known so the topic for today is operatives of internal threats in india and we have one of the most distinguished guest with us today we have writer columnist independent writer we have shifali ma'am with us ma'am with a huge round of applause ladies and gentlemen let me welcome shifali vaidya here to trivandrum ma'am it's a pleasure having you here as a part of youth conclave here in trivandrum it's a pleasure having you so as a small introductory part how do you feel being here on this occasion here for the youth conclave here in trivandrum namaskaram ella varkum i am very grateful that i am in uh, shri padmanabha kshetram i also come from goa which is also parshurama kshetram so in that sense it is uh, very much a homecoming actually and i've been to kerala before but uh, not here and i'm especially happy that there is this youth hindu conclave that's being organized here and i cannot think of a better uh, location than at uh, lord padmanabha's lotus feet so i'm very very happy to be here yes and without much delay ma'am i'm straightly heading into questions sure. ma'am the topic for today's session operatives of internal threats in india so when we discuss about internal threats that this country has faced i don't believe we have to stick on to a period after 1947 this country has always faced threats uh, like beat uh, the cultural invasion uh, what whatsoever we have faced before 1947 we have always resisted protecting the motherland from cultural invasion beat the british dutch french anyone we have always resisted so as an introductory portion how do you define the history of internal threats that this country has faced um see uh, there are a lot of people who will tell you the left their favorite narrative is that india was not a country before the british came in came in it was just a landmass yesterday nan kumar ji talked about it that there was no such thing called bharatavarsha so it's the british who gave us that uh, tag of a country is what they are saying that the british gave us roads the british gave us railways british gave us a lot of nice things they don't talk about british gave us jallianwala bag massacre they don't talk about british giving us bengal famine they don't talk about british sucking us dry but their narrative is india was not a country to begin with but that is not true india has been bharatavarsha for thousands of years and the political power may have been different as in there were always many kingdoms in this big cultural landmass but the place was always united and culturally we were always together that is why if you go to odisha today and if you see uh, the caves of udaygiri you find a uh, epigraph of an emperor called kharavela this is more than 2000 years ago and in that he talks about the king having gone on a pilgrimage to the word used there is bharata vassa meaning he went from east to west north to south on a pilgrimage to bharata varsha so that tells you that even 2000 years ago this complete landmass was known as bharata varsha and culturally religiously we were always united when adi shankara who started uh, from kaladi and when uh, the a great acharya one of the greatest thinkers that our dharma has produced we think that he is the reincarnation of lord shiva himself when he started off uniting india he went all the way from the tip of kerala to kedarnath 
and he went from kashmir to kanyakumari he went from the east to the west north to south and why he could go there and in those days you know today you can just hop on a flight and find the cheapest fare possible and go to kashmir in one day but it was not possible in that time more than 1200 1300 1400 years ago but even then people did pilgrimages they went from the tip to toe of india that is because they viewed india from himalayas to the sea as one contiguous cultural identity so we were always one now you come to your next question who were our enemies so our first enemies were actually external because india was a very rich very powerful country and economically we were one of the very best in many things we were uh, self sufficient in textiles we were self sufficient in spices we were self sufficient in jewels and that is what the attracted the world because we had so much of riches so why did the british come to india because they wanted the spices and the clothes why did the dutch east india company come to india because they wanted to exploit india so the these external threats came to india because they wanted to exploit india and with them came the bigger forces which attacked india's cultural integrity i call them the 3 m's mullah missionary and marxist and these are the three enemies who plague india even now and they are the greatest threat to india's uh, integrity and india's cultural unity today and they are more dangerous than external threats like pakistan or china or even any of the other countries because these threats they weaken the country from within uh, you've had uh, vivek agnihotri here and vivek agnihotri has written a whole book on urban nationalism where he has talked about how urban nationalism is one of the biggest threats that india is facing because you don't know who they are but they are everywhere if you have seen kashmir files you know there is that very famous dialogue in that movie where uh, the the marxist professor's character played by pallavi joshi she makes that epic statement which says that log aapke honge sorry system aapka hoga lekin chalane wale log to hamare hi hain that is the crux in one sentence of who are the internal enemies of india and the internal enemies have been trying very hard from the last 70 years to destroy this country from within now you will ask me if everything is bleak for 70 years they have been attacking every institution in india so why are we still here why do i see so many young people in this room in a place like kerala where the three ms are more powerful than any other state anywhere in india but you also see resurgences right you also see a lot of young people you are very young you are interviewing me that i find is a very heartening sign and i'll tell you why that is happening because deep within us we've always had resistance i come from goa which many of you might know or might not know one of the first indian territories to be occupied by the portuguese and the last one to be liberated so the portuguese ruled goa for 452 years they came to goa in 1510 and they left in 1961 and in the first 200 years of this 452 year rule at least they tried everything they tried sam dam dand bhed to convert the entire goa to christianity but it didn't work people left their land they migrated all the way to kochi they migrated to mangalore they migrated to other parts of goa but they held on to their dharma and where does this thing come from it comes from within you and i realized it especially when i went to uh, south america peru a couple of years ago and i saw that peru what what the portuguese tried to do in goa the spanish had tried to do in peru exactly the same thing converting people by force converting people by greed and destroying their culture and in just 52 years the entire country had become catholic entire country and the culture had died their religion had died now you see inca culture only in museums you don't see it living but we and goa this little place of goa it fought for 452 years but all the people did not convert to catholicism despite so many threats despite force despite greed despite everything so where does this resistance come from that resistance come from within us that is why till the last hindu is there in this country nobody can get rid of hindu dharma in this country because 
we have because our dharma is called sanatana dharma it's not without beginning and it's not without end since uh, ma'am you mentioned about foreign forces and foreign forces who try to dominate us who, who dominated us ma'am we had a history of dominance mm. of the british french portuguese that's everybody so even today in 21st century when we are sitting here in 2022 uh when we have several protest issues in our country if they want to play the playground is being set by certain forces certain yes. foreign forces yes. for instance if you take if you take a look at the farmers protest hmm. we had celebrity tweets which designed the protest yes we had the tweet from rihana yes then we had the tweet from greater tanberg which itself went very controversial after that yes then we had the media taking it up so this is not an innocent move this cannot be seen as a media innocence so these people are funding these people are purchasing certain uh, in fact if i be very specific of a senior journalist uh, rajiv sadesai Sade was suspended for around 2 weeks i guess from air yes. for for spreading a news of a farmer being shot dead yes. so how do you see the setting of a playground if they want to play cricket the cricket bat and ball is being supplied from abroad the ground is being designed for them and it's making their play easy how do you see that see one thing the congress did very well very well for them that is in the 70 odd years that they were in power is that they systematically captured minds by controlling institutions and what are the institutions that they tried to control they controlled academia they controlled media they controlled films the art and uh, the 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 sectors which are responsible for perception so that is where you have this image of so you see in hindi movies doesn't matter what the movie is about there'll always be some stock characters there'll be the greedy munim ji who will always be hindu and there'll be the good hearted guy who may be drunk but he's either a christian or he is that helpful guy who is uh, the token muslim so in a movie like shole which is basically a remake of a japanese movie and it's a movie about dacoits they live in some village fictitious village in up the entire village is hindu but there is a mosque and there is one old man who is muslim and he has a son so for two people there is a mosque with loudspeakers and the whole thing is in this movie i mean if you take out those two characters it doesn't do anything for the story of the movie but you have to show this good hearted muslim guy who gets killed by a hindu dacoit and then he talks about you know the benevolence of allah or whatever it is very 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 well placed even the movie like tana ji which happened last uh, year which is a sincere change a sincere attempt to change the narrative even there they have to include that token muslim guy who is good hearted and who whose heart is in the right place you know even though in tana ji the villains are very clear right the villains are uh, the mughals but despite that you still have that that little token guy so this is how they try to change minds and they try to change minds in academia where all the the history department the economics department the sociology department everything that has control over your minds that was taken over by the leftist thinkers and that is how textbooks have been written that is how uh, that is how our research papers have been written that is how people have been capturing minds of young uh, students generation after generation after generation so you don't talk about the temple destruction of aurangzeb at all but you write stories about how aurangzeb was a nice guy who needed caps in his old age to pay for his funeral you know which is true i am not saying that's not true but who is going to write about how he destroyed kashi vishwanath temple who is going to write about how he massacred the entire people of kashi who is going to write about the jizya that he imposed on the hindu citizens so if you're telling history then you should be able to dispassionately talk about history and say that this is what historical facts are this is what that person did and let the reader judge it no but the historians or distortions i would call them have been trying to constantly whitewash history i was having a conversation with shri sl bairappa it's on youtube and he was on one of the ncert panels in the 70s when they were trying this routine exercise of uh, rewriting the history books and when that meeting had happened 
they had given clear instructions that you shall not write about Islamic atrocities. So don't mention killings of Khilji, don't mention destruction of temples, don't mention destruction of Somnath, but write about how Mughals gave us biryani, how Mughals gave us Taj Mahal, and how Mughals gave us ga Mughal gardens. Only that you are allowed to write. So uh, Bhairapachi said, but this is not correct, this is wrong, this is not history, you are just whitewashing one entire side of the truth. So he was told, but if you tell the truth, then it will make people angry. People can't handle the truth. You know, like the movie in Officer and a Gentleman where uh, Jack Nicholson says you can't handle the truth. So that is what they said, that people can't handle the truth. So we should not talk about real history. We should give a nice rosy version of history where we talk about how Mughals gave us Taj Mahal and Mughals gave us Kathak and Mughals gave us Biryani and Mughals gave us a whole lot of things. So uh, Mr. Bhairappa says, I'm sorry, I disagree. So after that, when he put it on record, they disbanded that meeting. And after that, he was never called for any further meetings. They just dropped him from the committee because he wanted to speak the truth. His thing was, whatever happened in history actually happened. And we have to talk about it. Even today, if you go to Kashi and you go to the Kashi Vishwanath temple, the current Kashi Vishwanath temple, till a few years ago, before the Kashi Vishwanath corridor was completed, the approach road was from near that monstrosity that Aurangzeb had built. And if you see that monstrosity, you see three huge domes and half of that building is actually a temple wall. You can see the temple wall. The temple wall has been deliberately kept there. It's not that Aurangzeb didn't have the capability to completely demolish it and build a mosque. But he kept half a temple wall as a reminder for the Hindus that each time you go to Kashi, you see that half temple and you, it's like a slap in your face. It's like they're telling you that we broke your most holy temple and you could not do anything about it. So it's, it's a deliberate attempt to humiliate. And today when people go, and there was the original Nandi of Kashi Vishwanath, which was facing the original temple, obviously. So when the original temple was destroyed and the, that monstrosity was built, and uh, the Nandi was actually between that temple and the current temple, which was built by Ahilya Bhai Holkar. And the Nandi was turned opposite way, not facing the Shivling. But till three, four years ago, that Nandi was in one some obscure corner and you could not see it. Now, because of the Kashi Vishwanath corridor, that Nandi is part of the main temple. So when you enter the main temple, you see that here is the temple and here is the Nandi and the Nandi is turned away from the temple. So everybody who is coming to the temple, especially the younger children, they ask, but why is the Nandi not facing this way? What is the story behind it? And then people tell them the story that the Nandi is facing that way because that's where the original temple used to be, which is a fact. So now it's become a talking point. And that's how you tell your true history. So in just doing this, there is a massive correction of narrative has happened. But such correction of narratives have to happen on all levels, everywhere. Every single history textbook you open, you will find objectionable sentences. Sometimes it's so frustrating because everywhere you see whitewashing of history being done, everywhere, regionally. So for example, you are from Kerala, you probably know about Martanda Verma and you are from, probably from Trivandrum, so you know that he fought the Dutch and he repelled Tipu Sultan and all of that. How many people outside Kerala know about Martanda Verma? We don't. People in Karnataka probably know about Vijayanagar and Krishna Devaraya. Rest of India doesn't. People in Maharashtra know everything about Shivaji Maharaj. You may have just heard of Shivaji Maharaj, but you don't know the whole history of Shivaji Maharaj and how he understood the enemies and how he built an empire out of nothing. But everyone from Kerala to Tamil Nadu to Assam to Rajasthan to Kashmir knows who was Babar who was Shah Jahan, that Shah Jahan built Taj Mahal, who was Aurangzeb. So our Mughal lineage we know, we all know, because we've been all taught that. But we don't know our own history. And every time now I go to social media and I see threads about what rulers in different places have done, the kind of temples they've built, the kind of contributions they've made to the culture, I'm amazed because this is a part of our history that no one has taught us, which is very sad.
because suddenly you have this young generation of people people from your generation probably few of them manage to redeem themselves but most people will just go to schools and study whatever little they've been taught in school books and will think that this is correct history that is what we need to correct now so all these narrative building outlets or narrative building platforms have been setting the stage for the foreign forces to enter india and to attack them from within so somebody tries uh, and and the narrative is very uh, very 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 strange okay so for example if when the ram navmi celebration when the ram navmi procession like it happened in jahangirpuri and in many other places it goes to a certain area and it gets attacked by stone pelters then these media sections will say that but why did you deliberately provoke them by taking the procession to muslim areas right so that is one logic but in karnataka if the government decides that outside the temples we will not give stalls to any muslim stall holders that time they won't ask why should muslim stall holders have stalls outside the hindu temple it's the same logic right if you are saying that hindu processions cannot go in muslim areas you should also say that muslim stall owners should not be allowed to hold stalls outside hindu temples logical right so how can you have logic one way when it's convenient to you and uh, shout oh it's discrimination against minority and then say that hindus cannot don't have the right to go through muslim areas in a secular country muslim area uh, muslims got a muslim area in 1947 no so what is this muslim area nonsense now so ma'am uh, with that point uh we just talked about how this art and culture and history is being hijacked uh, by these certain uh, group of people mm -hmm. so two days before we had vivek ji here uh, and when i had a talk with him i just asked about the controversies that followed kashmir files and certain group of people has a serious problem regarding kashmir files if i come to specifics the senior leader of the left sitaram yachuri said that kashmir file is destroying the unity and integrity of the country and when i again come to specifics the leader of amadmi party arvind kejriwal on the floor of the house when he was asked about making kashmir files tax free which was done by many states in india on the floor of the house he said youtube pe dal do free ho jayega so what exactly now uh, we now certain people are coming up with the stories of kashmiri pandits with the history that was not spoken before so they have a real frustration out there so how do you see the statements made by arvind kejriwal and the important point to be noted delhi government has made many films tax free before so how do you see the statements of the left leader sitaram yachuri and the leader of aam aadmi party arvind kejriwal on the same context of kashmir files See, Arvind Kejriwal has been nothing but a glorified movie reviewer. So him saying that uh, movie dekhna hai to movie shouldn't expect government support that makes me laugh actually. But there is a greater problem with Kashmir files. You know how the left has been handling this whole Kashmir files thing? How they've been changing goalposts? It's very interesting because I've been analyzing it. So initially, when the movie got released, it didn't get very uh, many movie screens in the first two days or something like that. The 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 even the theater owners and all were not very keen to release the movie in multiple screens, right? So at that point of time, the left started writing this narrative: is that Vivek Agniyotri is a failed director. He doesn't know how to direct. He makes very bad movies. That's why this movie is also a propaganda film. So nobody is going to see it. That was the first thing. then in the first couple of days because of word of mouth the movie picked up suddenly not because of a lot of uh, publicity or not because of a lot of reviews or whatever it got very bad reviews in the mainstream publications but the movie still picked up because people identified with it and hindus for the first time felt that here was a story that nobody had told them and they needed to see this so after that the entire left you can go back and check this they changed their goal post to it's an exaggerated account of a few incidents few incidents where maybe you know two or three hindu kashmiri pandits were killed or whatever but it's like from bad movie bad movie maker it became to exaggerated propaganda movie all right so again the movie became hit because of people support 
So when the movie became a hit, they again changed the goalpost, and now they have started saying that okay, we agree that uh, Kashmiri Hindus have been killed, and we recognize that they have been killed, and yes, it's very unfair. This is uh, third time, but you know what? There were Muslims also killed, and if. 300 Kashmiri Hindus were killed, then there were 3,000 uh, Kashmiri Muslims were killed. That was the next logic. But who killed those Muslims? The Hindus were killed by the Muslims. Why? Simply because they were Hindu. Not for any other reason, but because they were considered Kafir. The Muslims who got killed in Kashmir, who killed them? Again, the same people who killed the Hindus, they were Muslims only. Why were the Muslims killed? The Muslims were killed because they were either thought of being khabris for the police, they were considered to be serving the government of India, or they were simply against the terrorist activities. That is why they were killed. So you cannot tell again only one side of the story and say that you know more Muslims were killed than Hindus, so let's just ignore Hindu pain. Then they shifted their goalpost again after this, once the movie became a massive hit. It's like, okay, okay, we know that, you know, Muslims were, Hindus were killed and it was very unfair and all that. But you know what? It was not the fault of the Muslims who killed them. It was the fault of Jagmohan. It was the fault of RSS. It was the fault of the BJP. The BJP was not even in, the, in power then at the state. But this is how the left keeps changing goalposts. And as an as a, as a observer, it's very fascinating for me to observe this and to find out how many times the goalposts have been changed. Normally, we don't do that. What Kashmir Files has done, there have been two or three landmarks in our battle for the narrative of the Hindu wing. I wouldn't call it right wing, but the Hindu wing. One is the emergence of young writers like Vikram Sampath, like Sanjeev Sanya, like uh, Anish Tripa Amish Tripathi, who have taken topics which are from our history, from our culture, from our heritage, and they've meticulously researched on them, and they've written good books which are very popular, and they have become legends overnight. Okay? So that is one way the narrative has been changed. Next is films are being made like the Kashmir Files. In Maharashtra, a lot of films are being made on the life of Shivaji Maharaj and what did he do. In uh, uh, a movie like RRR gets made in uh, Telugu. So even filmmakers are coming forward and touching topics which nobody had the courage to touch earlier. The third thing is Slowly, slowly, because of social media, ordinary Hindus are finding their voice. They are finding an outlet for what they truly feel. So from everything, every small thing like documenting the nearest temple in your village to reciting shlokas, anything can become viral today. Anything has the potential to reach millions of people without any editor, without any director, without any intermediary. So these are the three things that have helped in changing the narrative somewhat. somewhat. But again, I will say one of the biggest driver of this change is the change in political power. If there was no BJP government at the center, if there was no Narendra Modi as the prime minister, none of this would have happened. A movie like Kashmir Files wouldn't have been made, first of all. Even if it would have been made, it wouldn't have got screens and it wouldn't have been this popular. See, every idea needs to have its time. So political power is very, very, very essential for the intellectual sector to bloom. The left and the Congress understood this very well. So while they held political power, they made sure that they are intellectuals, they are writers, they are filmmakers, were given patronage and they were given uh, you know, enough uh, support to produce projects which basically falsified our history, which carried false narratives. Now that picture is changing somewhat. But we need more people, we need more scholars, we need more filmmakers, we need more writers, we need more uh, literary festivals like this, we need more conclave like this for uh, to rest back that intellectual space. Ma'am, since we talked about uh, political power, I would just like to draw your attention to the political parties. And if we take a look at the political parties that function in the country, we have the Congress on which we have faced the, they have faced the allegation of meeting certain officials from abroad having dinner with them rahul gandhi yeah. the photo the photos were out 
and we have the leader of the left going with china shaking hands with them uh, uh, participating in conclaves that china has organized being in meetings and they still very proudly say that china is being attacked by india and we have a senior leader in kerala of cpm who recently said that um, communist party is being attacked by both india and america and they are very comfortably working in india so my question uh, my prior question is how do you see the the operation of these people prior 2014 and post 2014 after narendra modi came to power how do you see that second uh, how how do you how do you distinguish how do you how do you see their alliance with the enemy countries like for example they are meetings with china they are they are you know their their collaborations with china and other foreign powers so how do you see that you know your kerala has two mps one from this place who thinks he knows everything that there is to know and the other is from wayanad who doesn't know anything so <laughs> so <laughs> these are the kind of people who are leading the opposition charge basically and they have always been in bed with the enemy always been in the bed with enemy but what has changed since 2014 is india being very ruthless in its foreign policy pursuits and saying that all that matters to us is our self interest we don't care about lofty ideas about world peace and democracy or whatever so if russia and ukraine are fighting that's okay we need oil so we are still buying oil from russia you don't tell us give us lectures about how we should be a democratic country or whatever and now india has the courage to tell europe that you are also doing the same thing so why are you lecturing us we have our external affairs minister who goes to the us who goes to washington and says in front of the american official is american counterparts that if you are worried about human rights violation in india we are also worried about human rights violation in the us could you have imagined this before 2014 this can happen because you have a strong leader and a strong economic resurgent india that is has the power and that is why nothing succeeds in the world like success if you are strong if you are economically resurgent people will respect you and it's the same thing with hindus the minute hindus start getting assertive the minute hindus start voting unitedly things change what happened in up it was a vote it was a hindu vote it was not a yadav vote or a dalit vote or a brahmin vote or any vote it was a one united hindu vote and you saw just a couple of days there were videos of the mosques taking off loudspeakers by themselves this happens when the hindu vote is united you have a, a, a chief minister in assam who has the guts to say that madrasas aids will be cut off completely he can say that because he has the power of the united hindu vote and he has a strong prime minister at the center so that is why it's very 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 important to have political power i know a lot of people you know every day ask but 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 narendra modi has not made a statement about this but 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 narendra modi has not made a bad statement about this he is a prime minister he has certain protocols to follow but he is because him he is he is the prime minister and because he is there in delhi yogi adityanath can go and bulldoze illegal property because he is the prime minister uh, uh, himant bishwa sharma can identify rohingyas and send them back why do we not see that and i live in maharashtra i know what lack of political power does and what kind of uh, minority appeasement is going on in maharashtra right now so political power to have that is very very important and india is a different country post 2014 and pre 2014 that is for sure ma'am uh, now i would like to go to very specifics like is media being an internal threat certain medias for example a media in kerala was banned uh, was banned because of certain news they have reported they are fighting the case in court so certain medias do they do they at certain times see they have a design they first started with anti modi then they go the anti modi campaign becomes anti hindu anti hindu campaign becomes anti national and when they are being questioned they very 
very very beautifully they play the card of being victims so certain medias i'm not i'm not uh, like i'm not generalizing it how do you see the role of media in supporting these threats see if there are threats they can be handled mm. but when there is a background support when when certain things are going certain background support will fuel uh, uh, will add fuel to the same when there are certain protests and when there are certain issues in certain universities of this country mm. see the media give them a very larger exposure i still remember when the issue of jnu came up for the first time they said that kanaiya kumar is going to bring down narendra modi and and a famous media in kerala reported that they said that modi is not going to sleep again yeah so how do you see the role of media in being a threat and supporting the threat and adding fuel to the same see mainstream media in india particularly in english has lost credibility big time if you see india today covers from 2000 what 9 you will see that every 2 years they come up with a cover issue with rahul gandhi in different stages of its youth or fading youth with the same title is rahul coming of age rahul is finally coming of age rahul has now come of age rahul will come of age it's been now what 2009 to 2022 it's been probably what more than 10 years but rahul gandhi has still not come of age so let's not give the media too much of importance there are legal safeguards which uh, have to be used by government agencies and more importantly by civil society i mean we should try doing the same thing that the left has been using against hindutva organizations all these years you know file so many cases that keep them busy that is what we need to do don't depend on the government for everything if you feel that uh, a particular media outlet has uh, done false complaints or uh, has uh, aired false news what stops our groups from uh, filing fir's against them that is how activism works and that left has done very beautifully all these years so there are some things you must learn from your enemies this is one of them but having said that now you have a channel like times now you have a channel like republic which do mainstream 9 pm shows on the topic of love jihad would you have imagined this before 2014 that they will even take this subject up what they discuss is a different story but the point is they are using the hashtag love jihad and they are doing a story at 9 pm prime time which many people are watching and they are at least giving out if there are five speakers at least two will be of the pro hindu uh, ideology that itself is a big change so let's not focus only on the negatives yes of course there'll be enough uh, media outfits which will try to give anti nationals footage or whatever so everybody try to you know say that kanaiya kumar is the next best thing and he is going to be the next prime minister where is kanaiya kumar now how many votes did he get against giriraj singh and he is a part of congress now but who cares yes, that, uh, that's exactly what i does saying. even rahul gandhi yes. know him yes so that's what i'm saying no so people of india are very smart okay they know and uh, everybody was surprised rather the left was surprised in 2019 when narendra modi won again and the bjp won again that is because this government knows its priorities so first is vikas people still vote for electricity people still vote for freebies people still vote for jobs people still vote for roads people still vote for toilets they do a section of people does then comes ideology and culture so it has to be both ways it has to be vikas plus culture vikas plus hindutva ma'am if we talk about we have talked many many things about the internal threats of the country if we take a look at the protests that came up after 2014 after uh, narendra modi came into power if you take a look at the designing of the protest certain universities hmm. they first started from universities and they they take up certain figures from the universities i will be very specific they concentrate whenever there is a protest beat beat the farmers protest beat cnrc protest any protest i know you might have observed that the students from the universities are being taken up and moved for the agenda they are making delhi a delhi a center point of their protest they are taking up students outside the uni- from the university to to protest and they say that okay the students of the country are protesting against the government so how do you see the designing 
of the protests concentrating the universities. They, they take up the students and they concentrate on certain universities and they take up two, three figures from every protest. Yeah. If it is the farmers' protest, they have a one or two students from certain campuses. How do you see the designing of a project, a protest project from universities? How do you see? See, again, it's a part of the toolkit of the protest. So you have two or three universities like Jadapur, like JNU, I'll name them, like uh, Hyderabad Central University. So these are the same three, four universities which will be the center point of all these agitations. And these universities have been traditionally left bastions and they still continue to be to a large extent. But the point is, the larger population is beginning now to see because now the truth is emerging from the other side as well. So the minute a mainstream media or a newspaper covers a story about JNU or whatever, you also know that there is the other side of the JNU project protest, which some other students have taken videos and put it out there. So that is one good thing. See, this situation is not going to change automatically, nor is it going to change immediately in one month or two months or whatever, because tenure track positions are very difficult to change. Nivedita Menon is still teaching in JNU. So that is something that is a greater problem. But having said that, you also have people like Anand, Natra, uh, Anand Ranganathan in JNU as well. So let's talk about the positive. Let's talk about what we can do. Uh, that's another thing. And uh, we talk about the world, uh, I mean, youth forum, Hindu youth forum. We really need to talk about making our line bigger. The problems remain. And the problems will have to be tackled at multiple levels. But what is it that each one of us can do? If you are young and you have certain skills, you may be able to give your time, you may be able to give your money, you may be able to give your expertise, donate some hours of your week for the Hindu cause and try to work at the base level. I know I can write. I know I can talk about culture. I know I can talk about lesser known temples. I know I can talk about textiles. So that is what I am doing. That is my own way. I'm also talking about politics, but I also talk about culture. I also talk about getting people interested in knowing more about our history and doing it in a fun way. Like what the left does is they use very, very provocative and very attractive vocabulary. They're, they have some pet phases, like they'll talk about conscience, they'll talk about democracy, they'll talk about choice, they'll talk about rights. These are catchphrases, okay? What stops us from using this? I'll give an example of the no bindi, no business campaign. I don't know if you've heard of it or not, but I would like to talk a little about it, not because I started it, yes, but- I, I have a question. Regarding yeah. that, I was coming to that question. Yeah. That was a revolution that you created. So what made you think of such a campaign? What made you start such a campaign? And did you think the campaign would go to that extent, which it went, which it really okay. went? So okay. I'll give you a little bit of context to this. Yes. So I have been watching the festival ads for Diwali, for Ganesh Chaturthi, for various festivals changing over the last few years. You know, till about five, six, seven years ago, all the Diwali ads had a very festive Hindu atmosphere. There used to be diyas in the background, there used to be garlands, there used to be people dressed in happy, festive, bright clothes. You know, one look at that image and you would know that you're talking about a Hindu festival, all right? But in the last four or five years, that started changing. So slowly, one by one, things started disappearing from ads. Diya started disappearing, murtis of God started disappearing, flowers in Rangoli started disappearing. Then the clothes started becoming more colorless, you know, instead of, the, instead of this bright pink, it started being beige and gray and dull, which is not what Indians wear most of the time for uh, their festivals. And the most glaring change was the disappearance of the bindi, which happened in the last five, six years. It was a very conscious decision by many brands. And they were still trying to tell Hindus that this Diwali buy from us, this Ganesh Chaturthi buy from us, this Gudi Padwa buy from us, this Yugadi buy from us. So I was like, I am a Hindu consumer, it's my hard earned money and I have every right to buy from a brand that respects my culture and traditions. So if you want my money, which is Hindu money for Hindu festivals, then I want a brand that respects my culture, that respects my festivals, that respects my traditions and shows it in the ends. That was the only thing. It's Diwali, it's Deepavali. It's not Jashne Rivaz or whatever shit that Fab India called it. 
so why call a hindu festival with a urdu name why show ads for hindu festivals where there is not a single hindu symbols there is no diya there is no sky lantern there is no flowers there is no rangoli how can it be a diwali ad that was my only thing so when i started this i was very clear that it was all about individual choice i was not saying that every hindu woman has to wear a bindi that is what the left deliberately misinterpreted the campaign but i had made it very clear and i had said speaking for myself that i refuse to buy from brands that don't respect my culture if you agree please retweet was the very simple tweet that tweet was retweeted retweeted by some 15000 people in 2 days and it got some i think uh, more than 25 lakhs views or whatever within 2 days so when i made that tweet i told my husband that you know what this is going to explode so two days i mean one day i'm not going to go on the internet the left made it big they made it about i am saying i am being an autocrat i am being you know fascist and i am telling women to compulsorily wear a bindi when it was very clear that i was not doing it but what that campaign did was it achieved something very important it made the average hindu aware of what's going on so even today wherever i go i have people who come up to me and tell me that ma'am after that campaign we started looking at ads we started looking at hoardings we started looking at festival advertisements and we started noticing that yes there is no bindi that's why it became big it it was started by me but it became a movement because the ordinary hindu understood what i was trying to say it it recognized what i was trying to say he he or she recognized what i was trying to say that's why that campaign uh, became big this time when i came uh, from i i flew from goa to bangalore and bangalore to tiruvananthapuram i met two women at bangalore airport who recognized me despite the mask and they were not wearing bindis but do you know what they told me they told me ma'am we are a big fan of yours from the no bindi no business campaign in trivandrum airport a woman told me that uh, oh uh, are you shefali vaidya i said she's been i've been following you and i really respect you for the no bindi no business campaign no bindi no business is not about compulsion it is not about forcing anybody to wear a bindi it is simply to tell the brands that if you want hindu money if you want hindus to buy from you for hindu festivals and i'm again being specific here then you have to respect hindu sentiments it's as simple as that and because of that brands changed their behavior in pune a big brand called png they had short ads without a bindi after this campaign so many people actually called them on the helpline and they told them we are not buying you we've been buying from you for the past 20 years but we are not buying this diwali because your model doesn't have a bindi they got like 500 600 calls like that they photoshopped a bindi after that Reliance Trends changed their TV campaign. The campaign that a Janvi Kapoor somebody sent me the visuals. So before my campaign, Janvi Kapoor didn't have a bindi on her forehead. After that, the same ad, the video ad, did uh, Photoshop the bindi somehow. So that campaign, even now, Malabar uh, Jewels was trending a few days ago, and I didn't even know about it. That campaign has now become people's campaign. But the point I'm trying to make here is that. i use the terms that the left could identify it that it's a matter of choice it's a matter of democratic rights it's a matter of consumer rights as a consumer i have every right to decide voluntarily where i should spend or i should not spend money that is the sort of thing that we need to use we need to make it about democracy we need to make it about rights we need to make it about choice use the same words we are about choice we are hindus we are liberal we just need to use that vocabulary to make sure that that message goes out there the you know hindus are the only two liberals in this country this country would not remain a secular or liberal country for one day if the demography changes not even for one day but that is something that everybody needs to understand and unfortunately hindus are the ones who need to understand this the most ma'am and i hope you would have noticed the recent incident that took place in in delhi in jahangir puri uh, there was a action by the delhi government to to move away the illegal residents south delhi so at that point of time uh, suddenly when the action was being taken the leader of the left brinda karat she just came in yeah. and then she just stood in front of a jcb and then she just uh, sh they just protested and they told that this is a action against muslims 
an action was taken by the government it was uh, it was a it was to take away the illegal residents yes. over there suddenly that changed into an anti muslim campaign and 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 we must very keenly see that the advocate that appear for them is kapil sibal yeah so so how is it when when the Del delhi municipal corporation was trying to make an action suddenly leaders come in the 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 advocates who take lakhs for an hour appear for these poor people do you see that an innocent campaign do you see it as an innocent campaign or an innocent act it's definitely not an innocent campaign and what brinda karat did honestly doesn't matter it is the court decision that we need to get worried about it's how the left is gaming the system if the court had said that the municipality is right in demolishing the illegal structures and the municipality was right morally in this in destroying the illegal structures then doesn't matter if brinda kara sitaram yechuri and their entire khandan comes and stands in front of the bulldozer it doesn't matter her actions it, it no, no one i mean who knows brinda kara in delhi nobody does that's besides the point the point is it is legal activism that we need to be worried about and we need we need to have high paying lawyers who appear pro bono or at least who appear to appear pro bono for hindu cases how many times do we have this that is the real need of the hour obviously somebody is paying kapil sibal probably a foreign power obviously somebody is paying dushan dave that is besides the point but how many people we have on our side who have that kind of commitment just um, advocate parasaran had that kind of commitment when he argued for the ram mandir case and he was barefoot the entire time because he was arguing in front of if, uh, on behalf of his lord shri ram so the entire case proceedings he didn't wear chappals in the court that was his commitment but how many lawyers and legal professionals do we have like that high paying people who actually would argue cases on our behalf but we have a devdat kamath who argues for the hijabis and who says that oh hijab should be allowed because the quran does it is quran the constitution these are the same people who talk about the constitution all the time right so when you when it's time to argue in the court then you say oh according to quran this is allowed but is quran the constitution so this is something that we need to it's again i'm telling you there is no point in blaming kapil sibal or dushan dave or brinda karat or whatever where are our legal cells where are the hotshot lawyers from our side who will take up these cases who will say that okay in a year i will take five cases pro bono i see in kerala and um, i am really amazed that in kerala we have hindu organizations which work so hard despite so many threats every one month or every two months you have cases of uh, sang swayam sevak being murdered even recently there was a case right uh, mr srinivasan but still people work on ground people work but we also need intellectual firepower we need more writers we need more filmmakers we need more legal professionals we need more people who understand the system and game it only then things will change if we keep finding problem we will keep seeing why they are doing this or why they are not reacting on this we are not going to go anywhere the important thing is to make our line bigger their line is where they where it is they have had a uh, advantage of 70 years but we need to seriously put in some efforts for that meets like this are very necessary where you provide a intellectual platform for young writers for young filmmakers for young lawyers for young uh, professionals to talk about what they can do for dharma ma'am we have talked a lot about the topic so how do you see it in specific if i ask you the operate the operation of this internal threat is it anti modi is it anti hindu or is it anti national how do you see it it is anti india modi just stands in the way you remember there used to be a poster which the bjp had said where basically it was mr modi's face and he's saying in reality they are not against me they are against you i just happen to stand in between that is true it is so much is their hatred for hindus mr modi is just the person who has enabled in the in the sense that he he has enabled the hindu aspiration so they hate him but if he is replaced by yogi adityanath do you think they will not hate yogi adityanath 
then they will suddenly say that modi ji was very secular i mean give us back modi ji any time so when uh, vajpayee was the prime minister it was like vajpayee is the worst prime minister we have had then when advani ji became more powerful it was like advani ji is communal vajpayee is secular then when mr modi came on the horizon it was mr modi is communal uh, advani ji is suddenly secular so if mr modi is replaced by yogi adityanath it will be you know yogi adityanath is communal and uh, modi ji is secular so it's not about modi ji they hate india they hate a resurgent india they would and they hate hinduism because we are the only culture that has survived despite so many attacks on us for so many years no other polytheistic civilization has survived this the egyptians didn't survive this the greeks didn't survive this the romans didn't survive this the incas didn't survive this the mayans didn't survive this no ancient civilization survives or is a living civilization in in the world today except for the hindu civilization and that is why they hate us shivani ma'am as we move to the last portion of the session i would like to draw your attention to kerala in kerala sir in recent times uh, certain things happened like a journalist from here siddhi kapan was arrested for trying to instigate violence in up and secondly a policeman was taken away from service for giving away the details of rss workers to pfi so he was taken out of service how do you see the hijacking of bureaucracy by these people how do you see how do you see their influence in bureaucracy it has always been there no they know how to game the system the misuse of power has been a uh, has been a what do you say a specialty of the congress and the left for many years the bjp has not yet learned to do that it needs to in my opinion okay so we have been talking for about about 1 hour now now we will move to audience and we'll take nammal oru i am switching to malayalam for a time being ഓഡിയൻസിൽ നിന്നും ഒരു മൂന്ന് ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻ നമ്മൾ എടുക്കുന്നതായിരിക്കും സോ ഹൂസ് ഓവർ വോണ്ട് ടു ആസ്ക് എ ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻ ക്യാൻ റേസ് ദിയർ ഹാൻഡ്സ് ആൻഡ് ഐ റിക്വസ്റ്റ് ദ കോർഡിനേറ്റേഴ്സ് ടു കൈൻഡ്ലി പാസ് എ മൈക്ക് ടു ദി കൺസേൺ പീപ്പിൾ സോ ദാറ്റ് ദൈ ക്യാൻ ആസ് ദ ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻസ് യു ക്യാൻ ഈദർ ആസ് ദ ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻ ഇൻ മലയാളം മലയാളത്തിൽ വേണമെങ്കിൽ ചോദിക്കാം ഇല്ലെങ്കിൽ ഇംഗ്ലീഷ് ചോദിക്കാം യു ക്യാൻ ആസ്ക് ദറ്റ്സ് അപ്പ് ടു യു ഓക്കെ ആൻഡ് ആൻഡ് ഐ റിക്വസ്റ്റ് എവ്രി വൺ ടു ബി വെരി സ്പെസിഫിക് ഓൺ ദി ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻ ക്വസ്റ്റ്യനിലേക്ക് നേരിട്ട് വരണമെന്ന് അഭ്യർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു അധികം നീട്ടാതെ ഉത്തരത്തിന് കൂടുതൽ സമയം കൊടുക്കാൻ അഭ്യർത്ഥിക്കും നമസ്തേ മാം ഐ എം ബിഗ് ഫാൻ ഓഫ് യുവേഴ്സ് ഐ ഫോളോ യു ഇൻ ട്വിറ്റർ ഓൾസോ സോ മൈ ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻ ഈസ് ദിസ് വി ആർ ബീൻ ടോക്കിംഗ് അബൌട്ട് ദ ഇൻറ്റർണൽ ത്രെഡ്സ് ഫ്രം മീഡിയ ടു ബിസിനസ്സസ് ടു ബ്യൂറോക്രസി സോ വാട്ട് ഡു യു തിങ്ക് ഓർ വാട്ട് ഈസ് യുവർ വ്യൂസ് അബൌട്ട് ദ ഇൻറ്റർണൽ ത്രെഡ് ദാറ്റ് വി ഫേസ് ഫ്രം ദ ജുഡീഷ്യറി ഓൾസോ വിച്ച് ഹാവ് ബീൻ ഗിവൻ lot of uh, in recent time also which were very controversial uh, judgments or observations which is entirely uh, away from the conscience mean the local conscience of the people yes that is actually the biggest threat quite honestly and i uh, it's it's above my pay grade to <laughs> answer what exactly can be done to to minimize this threat but it's legal activism and judicial activism is is probably the biggest threat everything else you can handle media you will have uh, new media houses uh, businesses you can set up your own businesses filmmakers you can make your own films but you can't you know have your own judiciary unfortunately so <laughs> that is is a worrying concern what really and it it upset me as a mother recently when the supreme court gave a judgment in a case where uh, they knew that a murderer was guilty he had killed a 4 year old child after raping her and the court said that we know he is guilty it's been proven he is guilty and uh, you know it's horrible what he has done but every sinner has a future and his crippled psyche needs to be healed or some such shit so i uh, pardon my language but if that is the situation then uh, i mean uh, it, it appalls me as an indian citizen that a murderer's right to heal his quote unquote crippled psyche is more important than the right to life of a 4 year old child what kind of society are we living in and this is legally sanctioned by the highest court in india that really shocks and scares me i mean i honestly don't have an answer to your question pari may substitute one thing yeah for everybody here this is a question this is a suggestion just go and find out how many judges have been elevated or got their position after just 14 years of practice 
how many judges have got advocates get their senior designation in 10 to 12 years of actual practice, which is the st minimum stipulated period. In Mumbai High Court it happened and elevated in 12 years. And later on, after a few years, he comes into the Chief Justice of Allahabad High Court and later on as a judge of the High Court. This is how they have filled their people with judiciary. People in the judiciary have been filled by the ecosystem, the same ecosystem explained by uh, uh, Shafali ji. We need to know the answer. Please raise your hands. Move an RTI before the uh, Bombay High Court register, saying that kindly tell us how many people were designated just after 12, 10 to 12 years of practice as senior, number one. How many judges were elevated? See, the constitutional provision is eminent jurist. How many such eminent cases did he do for getting elevated in the year 2000 as a judge of the Supreme Court? I am not taking anybody's name. Number three, please don't forget that during those days, the entire Maharashtra, especially the Mumbai advocacy, the official doom, the police, everybody was very managed by the underworld from across the border. This is also a recorded fact. All of you have to raise. Shefali or myself or Suresh raising the issue will not suffice. Now RTI is there. Start agitating this question. How many judges in 12 years of actual practice? The very basic question. You will find the answers. Things will start improving. That's what I wanted to submit. Thank you. Okay, we, we'll, take, we'll take one more question. We can take two questions. We can take two questions. My question is how we can deal effectively with this media jihad? Because the Kerala Hindus are the most unfortunate uh, TV viewers. Because whenever we open our channels, the media men are spitting poison against the Hindus, except some few YouTube channels and Amrita and Janam. All the news angles are uh, news uh, channels are anchored by anti Hindu journalists in Hindu names. I like to especially mention two names, Pramod Raman and Spradi Parakthikad. Uh, the only thing you can do in this situation is A, stop watching those channels and then write to those channels. Usually we, we don't watch what we don't like, but we never take the route of activism, we never take the root of writing to the chief executive of that channel saying that this is what is bothering me this is how the the coverage was biased and give proofs and say this is what we have a problem with if there are enough people saying it they have to because they are also there to make profits nobody runs a media channel for charity so they will take cognizance of the if thousand people write and say that this report was wrong and this reporter was biased and these are the reasons, this is why we are saying so, then they have to sit up and take notice. Even Rajdeep Sardasai was made to sit on a bench for two weeks. You need to show proofs and people need to be more active and they need to, see what happens with us is we are so busy in our daily lives and with you know facing the day to day uh, problems of our own lives that we get outraged, we get angry, we get sad but and we probably write something on social media and after that two days later some new news will come and we'll forget about it. But we need consistent action and for that we need to use all available channels including legal channels including filing cases on such people and such uh, channels. So that is something that we also need to, there are no easy solutions for it. I am sorry, unfortunately. Uh, we'll go to the last question from that person. Namaste ma'am. My name is Raj Loka. Uh, as we just spoke now, we have noticed uh, the killings of RSS workers and Hindus. This government, the current CPI government, have been give, giving trainings for the fire force workers for the SDPI workers. So when one section of the people start uh, starts to take the swords, how do we act? Um, how again, do we prevent this? Again, a very difficult question for me to answer. I mean, I have nothing but admiration for uh, the Sangh people who work in Kerala. I have seen, I have known, I have I'd done an interview with Sadanandan Master once and he had told me the story of what exactly happened to him and how they cut off his legs and just left him, you know, 
bleeding so there are horrible horrible stories i i know about that so i don't know what answer to give you but i respect that uh, that strength of character shown by the ordinary hindus of kerala who have been fighting this and i asked nand kumar ji this question once that uh, kerala is such a you know obviously very commy and very very um, definitely not god's own country so how is it that there are so many sangshakas and how is it that there are so many sang volunteers in uh, kerala he said that is the resistance that is the only way we can resist that's the only way ordinary hindus can resist so all i can say to you is i immensely respect your work and resistance is the only way i mean my people from my village resisted the portuguese even when the uh, odds were staked against them resist 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 in every way you can in every Uh, using every possible uh, means at your disposal but you have to resist against injustice ma'am we have been talking for an hour now so we have talked about the history of what the internal threats have done to the country how we resisted it and then we talked about the tre- threats in 21st century so after interacting with the crowd how do you feel after speaking for one hour how do you feel how do, what do you have to say to the crowd very grateful to it's it's a midweek session actually and i'm very grateful that so many people have come at this time to listen to this and uh, it's very heartening to see an event of this scale being organized in kerala and i request the organizers to keep doing this year after year and make it bigger and bigger learn from whatever went wrong this year and improve on uh, on it next year but this is something these kind of uh, platforms are very much necessary these kind of intellectual movements are very much necessary and uh, some of the sessions in fact all of the sessions i couldn't understand the malayalam sessions but all of the sessions the topics were very very interesting and that is how now at least we have media like youtube at our disposal so it's not that whatever is talked in this room stays in this room you can put it on youtube and it goes to the whole world and they can also listen to it so something like it is very necessary and i uh, say nanmi to all of you for being so kind and being here for such a long time thank you so much it's Ma'am. been a real pleasure I'm on behalf of the coordinators, on behalf of Hindu Mahas Ammelan Youth Conclave, and all the people out here. We thank you so much for coming here. Can I have the loudest round of applause for Shivali Vidya, ma'am? It was a pleasure having you in Trivandrum. Okay, I'm going to try speaking some Malayalam. Please don't laugh at sure, sure, sure. how I'm saying it or my accent. And please forgive me if I do something wrong. Shri Padmanabhante Nagarathil Vannu Oru Paripadil. சம்சாரிக்கன் கலியுனத்தில் எண்ணியுகு அத்தியாய சந்தோஷம் வந்து that was that was that was once again once again once again for the last time can i have the loudest round of applause loudest round of applause thank you thank you thank you thank you so much we are winding up the second session of hindu youth conclave here as a part of hindu mahas ammelan thank you so much for being with us we'll be starting the next session very shortly thank you so much for joining thank you once again